Welcome to Lost Without Japan, a travel podcast about the life changing experiences of exploring Japan and those moments we would be lost without. For your listening pleasure, allow me to introduce your very own Kanko Gaido, Michael. Welcome to a special Lost Without Moments bonus interview episode of the Lost Without Japan podcast. Our bi-weekly podcast is focused on getting you to Japan for your first visit or to make your next adventure to Japan an even better one. Today's special interview is with John Druzinski. I must say, I truly believe that our topic today fits in perfectly with the show, and I'm truly thankful for you reaching out after listening to my most recent interview with Susan Spann. I can also say that I'm thankful for John joining the listeners of Lost Without Japan, and I feel that the stories that you have edited together really fit anyone whose interest lies within Japan um, and without, for that matter, uh, shape and form. Being that we're getting close to winter, this is a holiday perfect gift as well, and one that includes the knowledges and experiences that come from living, teaching in Japan. And if you're like me that wants to move to Japan eventually, or just wants to make the most out of their visit and have it be something a little off the beaten path, this is the perfect uh, gift for yourself or for someone that is close to you. Welcome, John. Thanks so much for making time today for the listeners of Lost Without Japan. Yeah, thank you, Michael, and uh, very happy to be here. And thanks for the kind words about the book. And yeah, I'm very glad that from the beginning, you kind of hit the nail on the head there that, uh, you know, I hope to reach a diverse audience with this book because long-termers like me, I think it's of interest to, you know, compare experiences, but I think even minimal Uh, interest in Japan. It's more about, you know, a personal and cross-cultural journey. So I do hope there's uh, something for everyone. So thanks for mentioning that. And thanks for having me. Thank you. And before we get going with today's episode, where could listeners go to take advantage of getting a passion for Japan um, or other textbooks that you've written for Japanese culture, or perhaps just chat with you about the best NPB team uh, that there is? (laughs) Um, or answer any additional questions they may have after listening to our interview. Okay, well, a lot to cover there. But uh, (laughs) the book itself, A Passion for Japan, a collection of personal narratives, it is exclusive to Amazon, so uh, available as an e-book internationally. Um, Unfortunately, as a paperback, only in select countries, uh, including the U.S., Canada, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, uh, Germany, I believe, and a few others that I can't remember at this time. Um, So that's where you can get that. Um, And also... Uh, you can find me on Facebook. If you've read the book and enjoy it, there is a private group uh, that's easy to find, uh, just called A Passion for Japan, where a lot of the contributors are members. So it's if if you want to have a personalized um, discussion about some of the topics, uh, there's that as well. And I also have the Passion for Japan uh, uh, page or profile on Instagram. And you mentioned baseball as well. Um, well, my team, of course, um, our mutual friend, uh, Trevor Ray Chioda, uh, has his great site, uh, Hanshin Tigers English News, which is a wonderful resource. And for people that just uh, want to know more about Japanese baseball in general, even if you're a Giants fan, you know, you're welcome. Uh, there's a great, uh, fairly newish Facebook group called Japan Ball Community. Um, just very... <laughs> I shouldn't have to say this, but refreshing that it's a very friendly and positive group, um, very welcoming. So um, that's that's another uh, great resource. And if there are uh, English language teachers out there, as as you mentioned, I have written uh, three, co-written three uh, textbooks for um, the uh, English language classes at university in Japan. But there are two books called Surprising Japan and another one, uh, Working in Japan. The former on um, Shohakusha, which is a Japanese publisher, and then Working in Japan on um, uh, Sengage, or also known as uh, National Geographic Learning. And all of them have uh, been co-written with 
but Alice Gordenker, a amazingly talented uh, journalist based here in Japan as well. Um, so people can, uh, again, find me on Facebook if they have questions about those textbooks as well. Sounds really good to me, John. And I got to tell you, after seeing the uh, Tigers play live, I absolutely fell in love with them, the stadium, the fans, everything. And so much so that I actually pay to watch them by internet, uh, <laughs> you, you know, as well. Uh, and I, I agree, the uh, Hanshin Tigers uh, English News podcast is one to follow uh, for all of you uh, fellow fans. It's you know, funny after going to the game that, to find out that they're a lot like my, uh, you know, Chicago favorite team, the Cubs, <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of different ways. So, <laughs> yeah, and I'm a Red Sox fan, so I think that, that all three of those teams have uh, similarities. Although the Tigers are the ones that still need to break their curse. So, uh, and no goats or bambinos uh, there. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, well, it'll just be Col- something. Colonel Sanders, but. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, John, I like to start off uh, just g- giving you an opportunity to share a little bit about yourselves. I um, mean, really, this is anything um, that you'd like to share uh, that could be both professional and personal. But I'll uh, turn it over to you, my friend. OK, well, a long story. But um, yeah, just to uh, I am originally uh, I'm American from uh, central slash upstate New York, however you want to call it, a tiny little town called Oswego, which um, usually makes the news for its uh, snowfall. Small claim to fame is Jerry Seinfeld uh, did attend SUNY Oswego for one semester and and did reportedly refer to our hometown as idyllic, uh, I guess idyllic enough to stay for a whole semester, um, but the rest is history. Uh, I am an army brat, so my father was uh, in the Marines in the army, so I screw up all over New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Texas, Wisconsin, and that kind of put the travel bug into me. Uh, but most of my adult life has been overseas. I first came to Japan in the mid nineties, uh, living up in Sapporo in Hokkaido, uh, still one of my favorite parts of Japan. We'll probably touch on that later. And then, um, went back to grad school in the States, uh, a couple years in New Zealand, uh, another one of my favorite places. And then uh, came back to Japan, the Kansai area, where our beloved Hanshin Tigers are based, uh, in 2004, and amazingly have been here since, and teaching uh, English at the university level, and involved with other writing and editing projects. And uh, I say in the book, I used to joke that uh, when people asked me how long I'd stay in Japan, I'd say, well, I have to live in Kansai until the Tigers, you know, finally win the Japan series again. And, <laughs> and here we are, nearly 20 years. And the funny thing is, is the Oryx Buffaloes, our other Kansai team, uh, won this year. So, um... Maybe it's in the cards, but that's another story. Hmm. Oh, I I love it. I said watching uh, Kosuke Fukudome uh, play last time, uh, also for the Cubs, and getting to see him play uh, for the Tigers for that bit uh, when I was there uh, was a wonderful thing as well. Uh, and one other thing I want to follow up with uh, is I kind of like to ask, especially with you being in a creative field, what is your earliest memory of doing something creative? I think with most creative people, this would start from early childhood, but I was struggling to come up with a memory of that. Um, I would instead focus on when I first found a kind of a reward for creativity. And I remember being in high school, had just moved to the small town of uh, Toma, Wisconsin, in, in southwest Wisconsin, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, And, you know, just trying to fit into another new school. And we had a writing class and um, we were working on some creative writing. And and it was one of those exercises. I think we all took a random picture and we had to make a little story out of it. And then they asked for volunteers or forced volunteers to read their story to the class. And I was just horrified. You know, I was very introverted growing up and I was the new kid. And they got to me and, you know, hands trembling. I read my story and there was this 
pause and the, the class just applauded. I'm pretty confident it wasn't sarcastic applause, but, um, you know, I just really realized that this creativity is a way to, you know, connect with others, you know, especially in a new, um, in new environment. And then I, I, I had a, a wonderful, uh, English teacher that year, uh, Mary Rich, who just filled me with confidence because she it just stopped me in the hallway. I thought I was in trouble. And, and she just looked me in the eye and said, I just read your report. You've got to become a writer. And I was just, you know, I'd never had a teacher praise me in such a way. And I did go on to major in, in creative writing at, uh, at SUNY State University of New York at Oswego. So I'm sure as soon as the show is over, I'll think of an earlier memory, but I think it's more important, again, to focus on creativity that has some reward, whether intrinsic or extrinsic. We, we definitely have a lot in common. I was not a military brat, but my dad was in sales. And it's one of those things I joke that he was fortunately and unfortunately good at his job. So whenever <laughs> he fixed an area we were in, we had to move to another location that needed help. And we were moving every year or two years. So a lot of people, when I say how often I moved, they're like, were you a you know, military brat? I'm like, mm-hmm. no, but <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, super thankful for it because uh, you get out of your comfort zone. And I agree with you, th- that much moving and that much uh, exposure uh, to the world really does want to make you see more than just that little corner of the woods that you're, you know, in yourself. So how did you fall? And it's, I wouldn't say fall, you had to work to get into that, but land an opportunity to be a professor at a university in Japan? So, yeah, it was a slow, gradual climb. But um, my first stint in Japan in Sapporo, I, I was only working in Eikaiwa, the English language conversation schools. And I knew, I knew I liked this job enough to make it a career. But I also knew that the Eikaiwa business wasn't a career path. Um, So I did, again, get my master's in Vermont at the uh, School for International Training. My two years in New Zealand, I was a visiting professor, and I was fortunate to get in when I did, uh, because I'm saying it's much stricter now about uh, a PhD requirement to really get your foot in the door, other other than just basic uh, part-time work. So uh, I was very fortunate to find... uh, Kwansei Gakuen Daigaku or Kangaku, a, a great private university in the Kobe area. Um, at that time, priority was was fresh out of grad school, uh, younger uh, teachers. So um, um, I had the bonus of also having some experience in Japan. Uh, so they knew I had some of the language, some of the cultural understanding. So, you know, that was only a contract job. So I did a couple contract jobs and then uh, started uh, publishing so that... Um, you know, research articles. So that just opened the door to uh, my current position at uh, Okayama University. And for listeners, including people based in Japan who don't know Okayama, if you just kind of look in the middle of Hiroshima and Kobe, we're, we're there. Uh, wonderful uh, place, uh, you know, um, in the Sea of Japan, or the Inland Sea uh, area. So uh, yeah, not the Sea of Japan. <laughs> I've confused people more. But uh, yeah, so that's how I got into that. I like it. And I, Hiroshima, that area is one of my favorite uh, places to uh, be. I've made friends that are out there and I find, uh, you know, throughout Japan, you're going to meet wonderful people. But that has been some of my uh, best experiences uh, personally, uh, myself, especially in the uh, Hiroshima area. So, (laughs) yeah, and just I didn't um, I think you also asked about the like textbook or or publishing. And um, the lesson here is just you know, don't be afraid to try to reach out to interesting people. So I I mentioned Alice Gordanker previously. So uh, many years, she wrote a great column in the Japan Times called What the Heck is That? And it was basically mostly foreign residents or visitors who would see, you know, something odd, different in Japan and, and write to her about it. And she's fluent in Japanese and she has a journalism background and, um, and there's also, as you probably know, in Japan, there's an expert for everything, be it like toilets or manhole covers or you name it. So she would find these experts and interview them and write these wonderfully informative columns that were, you know, the target audience in the Japan Times was, was 
you know, foreign, generally foreign readers, but she also got a great response from uh, Japanese readers with a high level of English who said, you know, you're teaching me about my own culture as well. I took these things for granted. I never thought about the history. So I reached out to Alice because she did an article about, um, I was cycling in um, rural Kyoto and Michael, I'm sure you've seen the, um, the Japanese version of the scarecrow where they'll like hang a, a plastic crow upside down to, to try to scare. And, and I'd never seen that before. So I, I took a picture. I sent it to Alice. She did a column about it and I wasn't going to bother, but I, I just said, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but you know, have you ever considered making your columns into a textbook for Japanese students? Because these are things that even Japanese people don't know. And, and they're very fascinated by, you know, foreign views of their culture. So uh, she was like, no one has asked me, but let's do it. And so we met in person and we went on to have a wonderful working relationship, uh, made three textbooks together. So never be afraid to reach out and make these interesting contacts. You get the question asked, of course, with you being in Japan and not from there. Having moved so much, was it just that you were younger, having like wanting to explore outside of the U.S.? Or like what led you in that direction? Yeah, I, I like to tell my students, you know, we have this famous question in Japan. Everyone wants to ask, why did you come to Japan? And, and I tell my students, it's better to ask people like me, why have you stayed in Japan? Because uh, I, I have a much better answer for that. Um, like, and you might relate to this, and, and uh, a lot of people, you know, like myself, didn't have a long-term plan with Japan. It was a one- or two-year adventure, and the rest is history. When I was graduating um, with my degree in creative writing, so of course employees were knocking down my door like, oh, you did creative writing, we need you. Um, I hope my sarcasm is coming through here. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's hard when it's only audio. But um, So I had an older cousin who was in Japan in 94 and used to send me these great letters, if people remember those, handwritten letters, um, just telling me these tales of his life here. And, and so I followed soon after. Again, it was just a one or two year adventure. And this probably comes up in the book, but I think where you end up first, you know, plays a huge role because, you know, I've, nothing against Tokyo. It's an amazing place for many people. But if I had gotten a job in Tokyo, I probably would have been gone after a year or two. It was just a bit overwhelming for me. But as I previously mentioned, I was lucky to get a job up in Sapporo, uh, Hokkaido, just an amazing place. Um, so that made me stay longer than I expected. Um, but yeah, just uh, why I've returned, why I've stayed, just the, um, you know, the food culture, the sports culture, the, the safety, the, the punctuality. Um, yeah, just a appealing, you know, lifestyle. I'm, I'm comfortable here now. More and more in common, my friend. I, I don't know if it's uh, the rural setting or living in smaller areas first when I was younger in life, but I feel the same way. I can be in Tokyo for a set amount of time, but then I have to get out. I'm way more comfortable, you know, out in, uh, like I said, Hiroshima or just the, the areas outside of that as well. It's a fabulous place to visit, but I don't know that I could live there for <laughs> any length of time. Yeah. And the amount of time I can stay is getting shorter as I age as well. And I, I was just horribly naive, you know, when I first arrived, I, cause I was doing all my job hunting, original job hunting it back in the days when you could just come to Japan without a job is what I did. And so I was going all over Tokyo job hunting and being from small town, New York and never using like public transportation in my life. Cause we, we drive in America, like you get these rush of people coming off the train and I would naively step to the side, like against the wall and think that once this rush was over, you know, I'd have the train station to myself, but you start walking and, and the next rush comes and, and people are perfectly polite, you know, there's no pushing or shoving, but these crowds were just, you know, horribly overwhelming uh, for me. What are some of your favorite foods or places that you might like to visit for a meal where you live or where you've lived before? I kind of separate this into my, my blue collar and white collar Japan. But, you know, when I'm kind of a Friday night, um, you know, end of the week type of thing where you just need to unwind, uh, you can't beat yakitori. Um, and I fell in love with yakitori early in Sapporo. It's just what I love is, um, you know, I miss American food. Um, but what I love about 
Japanese food and you could talk about like Spanish food tapas style as well as just the the smaller portions that let you try a little of everything I mean you you can just go on and on with a yakitori menu and have you know chicken and beef and and pork and and all kinds of you know vegetables too mushrooms uh shishito little hot peppers um uh, so nothing beats a good yakitori meal when you need to unwind. And if I'm feeling a bit fancier, a good sushi meal, of course, um, uh, can't be beat as well. So, uh, and I, again, I was lucky to live in Sapporo first because uh, that kind of spoiled me because even the, the kaiten, you know, revolving sushi in Sapporo is, is generally pretty good quality. And when you're in Japan, what are your go-to locations that you want to be able to visit when you get outside of you know, your teaching uh, duties and have that chance to get out on your own for a bit. Yeah. So I have a few uh, uh, power spots and I guess I can share them because uh, they're all famous enough. I'm not giving away any secret spots. Um, a term that comes up in the book is is power spot. And uh, I guess we do call them maybe healing spots or something in English. Um, so I do have this kind of tradition where places I like to go when I finish the first week of a new term, when I'm just overwhelmed by like 200 new students um, and all the energy that takes. So uh, one place in Kansai is up in Mount Koya, uh, Koya-san in uh, Wakayama Prefecture. So very spiritual place. Um, a lot of people go there to stay in the temples, which there are over 50 temples you can stay in. Uh, the Shukubo is what they call the temple stay, but uh, there's a wonderful guest house there now uh, called the Koyasan Guest House or Koku, uh, run by uh, a Hanshin Tigers fan, I need to add as well, a uh, Japanese guy who's, who's lived in England. So that's a little weekend escape for me. Um, the Kumano Kodo as well, the uh, pilgrimage trails, uh, which I'll be on later this month, uh, running through Wakayama. Um, Nada and Mie Prefecture, uh, where you can just combine wonderful hiking with with food and and onsen hot springs, uh, and one more as a cyclist, I, I gotta mention the uh, Shimanami Kaido, um, which is my favorite bike ride in Japan, which starts in um, in Imabari, a small town in Ehime Prefecture, and then you cycle about seventy kilometers over a series of uh, seven bridges into Onomichi in Hiroshima Prefecture. So uh, I was there last month after classes started. Always a highlight. So those are a few of my uh, my power spots. We were talking a little bit before we started rec- recording, and uh, Kimono uh, Kodo is like, I want to be able to do the hike with that. It's just going to have to be when I, you know, following trip when it's by myself because my son's going to want to spend as much time catching as many baseball games as possible <laughs> and you know, in Tokyo, and I'm not going to deny I'm uh, catching some parks that I've not gone to myself. So it's going to be wonderful, wonderful. I raised him right. He likes the Red Sox, likes the Cubs, and just enjoys sitting and watching baseball from Japan as well. So, you know. <laughs> Sounds like a great kid and a great father. And, and he will be a Tigers fan in the future as well, right? There's no, he already is. Already is. I've got, he, unlike me, has not had someone take his hat. So he still has it. Then he has the Hanshin Tigers towel all ready to go uh, when we go to our next game. So it's going to be, he, he, he's set, he's set. Um, what do you like to do? It's already come up a little bit, but when you're done teaching and editing, is there anything besides your hiking and cycling that you also like to get up to? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, my job is so indoors. I am outdoors as much as possible, but I'm a voracious reader as well. So, uh, when we do have our rainy season or a gloomy day like today here in, in Kansai, um, I do a lot of reading, all kinds of topics, uh, movies, etc. Um, but yeah, outdoors um, as much as possible, traveling as much as possible. Hmm. I, I like it. And I know that you're going to be, uh, you have talked to or going to be talking to um, a fellow uh, friend of the show with the Hanshin Tigers podcast about baseball. So I'm going to let listeners uh once that comes i'll provide a link to that interview as well so they can hear it but let's go ahead and focus a little bit more on one of your other passions which is sumo and i was very fortunate to catch my first tournament last time i was there before things shut down what as a fan yourself could you give for anyone that's looking to uh you know see this for the first time or maybe have a better experience on a return trip 
So fortunately, it's it's wonderful that Sumo is totally back now because um, uh, the good thing about Sumo is it rotates. Um, so six tournaments a year, every other month, and you know three of the six tournaments are in Tokyo, but then the other the other three are in different cities. So Nagoya here in Osaka and uh, Fukuoka, which is happening at the moment, and I'll be watching later today. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of advice about Sumo is one, don't be put off by the price. I'm surprised by when I mention Sumo to my own Japanese students, they're convinced that it's this, this super expensive, um, event, but it's not, it's, it's only expensive if you're sitting down close, which a tall American like me would never last the day anyway, because you're, you're crammed into this small tatami box with um with four people so the sumo arenas are all um you know fairly small so uh if you even if you know what we would call the nosebleeds aren't so it's um you know all all seats are good and the the higher seats up are probably about three or four thousand yen um which i won't calculate the ridiculous uh exchange rate at the moment but uh uh, it's more about the positioning. So try to, um, you know, when you buy sumo seats online, I think you can see where they're located and it's all about getting the, um, the direct view where you can see both wrestlers, you know, on your left and right. Um, that, that's much more appealing than being close. Um, cause if you're close, but if you're looking behind a wrestler, uh, we, we won't get into the, how unappealing that might be. Um, but just the direct view. Uh, is important. Uh, another thing I would say is just make a day of it. Um, I mean, people don't realize this starts at like nine in the morning and, and there might be like a couple hundred people there. And cause there's just so many ranks in sumo. So I, I, I can't say for sure, but I, th- I think a lot of the venues do let you leave once and, and return. So, you know, come in, check it out in the morning, walk around, soak up the atmosphere. Especially if you're in the Koku Gikan in Tokyo, which all the sumo tournaments are great to see, but there's just a special, you know, historical atmosphere with, with Tokyo. Um, so yeah, make a day of it, uh, wander around, wander in and out. Um, and one more thing is, you know, if there's not a tournament on, I don't know the current status, but back in the nineties, we visited, uh, the stables, um, the, uh, sumo bea by ourselves. And that was just fascinating because we were, we didn't have an appointment. The only appointment you needed, needed at the, the only place you couldn't visit at the time was uh, Futagoyama Bea because this was, these were the days of uh, Takanohana and Wakanohana. So way too popular to allow. Um, but we went to some other, and, and a lot of them are pretty close together in the uh, Ryogoku area um, where the Koku Gikan is. So it was me and my cousin and a Japanese friend, and, and we didn't even call in advance. We just mostly showed up and said, can we come and watch? And you're literally sitting on a tatami mat, you know, right behind the Oyakata or stable master. So uh, Chiano Fuji, one of the greatest sumo wrestlers of all time, Kokonoe Oyakata, you know, we were we were sitting right behind this guy, and we we couldn't talk to him or anything, but you know, imagine going to a Cubs game and, and sitting behind the manager as he's, you know, you know, leading the troops. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure the current status with that. And you would probably need a Japanese speaker with you, but it, it's something they probably have tours for by now. But again, the tournaments are only every two months. So if there's not a tournament on, go see a stable. That would, it's, it's almost even more interesting because you're, you're in their home, you know, you're, you're watching. And they all practice together. So you'll arrive early, you'll see some 16-year-old kid, skinny as a pole, standing in the corner, and then, and then you know, Akebono or Musashi Maru, well, not now, but in those days, walks in. So, so fascinating cultural experience. I like it. And it's, I agree with you making the full day. I made the mistake of thinking that I was going to have sumo and fireworks all in one day. And I felt like I really <laughs> cut short that sumo uh, time and had to rush for the fireworks. It would have been much better to have maybe the day before have it gone and see what I could have and then, you know, done both because it was just beginning to 
pick up and become you know more and more full and we were we were fortunate that someone that knew what they were doing when they purchased the tickets bought them for us because we had a nice view <laughs> it's like sometimes it's best right. <laughs> to rely upon someone else because i'm like i didn't know i didn't know but right right but the real reason we're here today is to talk about a passion for japan and i must say that i truly enjoyed reading the experts that i have and I can say that it really has something for everyone, uh, even if they're not just a Japanophile. When I started looking at the book and I wanted to read one section, how you have it grouped really led me to read who was next. And like that, that tie together. Could you share a little bit about that, about how you ended up putting the, the, this together? Yeah, it's hard to give a short version, but um, maybe three main, you know, motivations were, um, again, going back to my working partnership with, with Alice Gordenker, around 2014, we did a book called Working in Japan, and the concept was to interview non-Japanese, again, working in Japan, and, and that was quite eye-opening, because I'm in my English teach, I, you know, I like to get out there and meet different people, and but it was quite eye-opening in my English teaching bubble just to see, you know, 14 people we profiled in these books, and they were all doing, you know, completely different things in Japan, from English teaching to running a animal welfare organization to, um, you know, working with computers or recruiting. It had always been kind of in the back of my mind to kind of explore this uh, more. And kind of another motivation was I haven't seen a lot of like anthologies about Japan. You you get this you know more famous um, long term residents like Robert Whiting or um, Alex Kerr or Karen Hill Anton who might write memoirs. But um, you know so many people have a great story to tell, but you know maybe not a full memoir, a full book. Um, so I'm a big fan of a th- anthologies. Like every with Christmas season coming up, I'm always getting the Best American series, best American sports writing, best American essays. Um, so I, I was hoping to put together a Japan version of this, and and finally the timing was just right. Where I was on a sabbatical last year, and I was um, just looking for a project, and it just it all kind of clicked. And especially, um, and I, I, I had also turned 50, so I was kind of in this, I was outside of Japan for half a year, and I was growing old and, and getting, you know, kind of um, reflective. So, you know, kind of thinking like, you know, I need to, you know, have a project that, that puts out there what I want to say about Japan and, and give people an opportunity to, to read more of these, you know, wonderful experiences. So... Yeah, that's kind of how it all came together, those many different inspirations. One of the things I truly enjoyed was just holding that physical book in hand. And one of the things that you had said was the book isn't really meant to be page one to the end of the book. It's something, you know, something's meant to be done differently in that. Could you just share a little bit more about how one might go about enjoying a passion for Japan the most? Because I travel so much, I do have a Kindle and it's my best friend. I I do have a lot of my books on Kindle, but I do miss that feeling of a book in the hand. And and this is one, you know, not just because I'm the editor, but I do feel that it's it's kind of better in paper form. Yeah, because you've you've got the uh, pictures as well. and, and And you can go back and forth on an ebook but it's it's a bit um it's a bit you know not very convenient it's a selection of personal collections so um i i do in you know people can read it in any order they like i just hope um i hope they do read them all and i think again that's why i really like anthologies cuz you know, I would make the mistake in the past of, you know, i'd get say the best american sports writing anthology and and you'd get to it chapter about soccer or even chess say and and i'd skip it and like uh, i don't like that and then and then i get to the end of the book and feel kind of disappointed but then i'd find you know more times than more often than not i'd go back and and those chapters i skipped would often be the best ones because i was making the mistake of of just focusing on 
the topics, the sports I liked. And it wasn't about that. It was about the story, about the writing. And I think it's the same with this book. If I, if I wasn't the editor, I would probably open it up and go straight to the Hunching Tigers chapter or the Sumo chapters. Um, but they're all, you know, equally good. It, it's not, and, and as the editor, the great thing was, is, you know, I, I learned a lot about Japan, you know, uh, there's, you know, things like the tea ceremony that I, I knew some about, but, but it's just a different perspective when you, you read someone's personal relationship with that passion. And I think through that enthusiasm, you know, then, then you kind of get it that, you know, a lot of people would have zero interest in, in baseball, but then if you see the passion of the Hunching Tigers fans or something like that, you might, you know, get a little more interest because of that enthusiasm about it. So, um, so people can read it in any order, but um, I do hope they don't skip any and go back and read them all. That would be, that would be my advice. And it, it's not explicitly written in the book, but they are kind of by, there are little themes. So, uh, I found out that it, at first I was like, well, can I have more than one chapter about sumo? Uh, but then I realized that it was all about the perspective. So, you know, just sumo as an example, um, I've got uh, Tim Craig, who is a, came to Japan in the 70s and, and, you know, no professional relationship with sumo. He's just a fan, but he had this fascinating story of, you know, living in rural Iwate Prefecture in the 70s and how you know, sumo was one gateway into the local community for him because he would, he didn't, he didn't have a bath or shower in his apartment at the time, if you can imagine that. So he'd go to the local sento and, you know, all the local old guys would be watching sumo and he, he didn't really need to know the rules. He could just get caught up and speak with them. And, and then on the other hand, uh, Katrina Watts, an Australian contributor, actually you know, worked for NHK and the Sumo Association as a interpreter and and an announcer, and um, so I think it's great to have both of these stories. And there's several places like that. So again, I think the perspective perspective being it their connection with the passion uh, could be gender, could be nationality, but uh, there are several little themes uh, sections, if you will, through the book. So read them all. And one thing I like is that it's more than just like a love letter to Japan. It's it's it is positive, but there are struggles associated with that, and that really does lead to it being a lot deeper than just you know I love and this is amazing and this is here. There there's truly a lot and something that helped me connect with a lot of these different writings that I may not have otherwise and. One of my favorite that I've read so far, and we'll get to it, I know, a little, little bit, but was just about calligraphy. And that's not one of the things that I first jumped to. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but their life stories. How did you end up coming into contact with so many people that have all of these different uh, amazing stories to tell? Right, right. And if I could just touch on the um, what you mentioned first about not being a love letter. And because and I just I thought that was very important because you know, you get, you know, you look around Facebook and see these kind of visit Japan pages and, and it's just so glorified about how perfect and amazing Japan, not that it's not, but it's just, um, you're going to get a very different perspective as a long-term resident. And no matter how much you love Japan, I'm, I'm sure all of us have, have struggled. Uh, and it's some of the people that struggled more who, who appreciate it more now, who have a greater story to tell, which I can give some examples of that later. But, um, you know, so I did tell, I did tell contributors, you know, it's not a love letter, uh, don't rant, but uh, but openly talk about your struggle. We want to hear your struggle. Uh, it's it's inspiring, and um, and again, that's why I think I hope that's good for for people that might be new to Japan or even I mean, people have been here for years and they they've never got on over their their frustrations. So uh, and then just people who are taking on any type of cross cultural journey or challenge, uh, I think these these stories are inspiring. Um, what I did like, though, that, you know, most chapters do end on a very positive note. So it was just one of these things of, OK, I, I struggled, I went through this. But in the end, you know, I can say I appreciate Japan. Japan has given me this amazing gift and I've had a good life here. And and I think that was a great way to end, you know, each chapter. Oh, so the uh, so going back to um, 
you know, how I found these amazing people. Um, I started with, with people I know or know of, and again, kind of reflecting on my time in Japan, you just, you see these people who just kind of manage to fit in and go with the flow. Like you can see that they've made Japan their home. And some people that sadly, even after decades, have never really done that. So I was constantly on the search for, you know, what separates these people. And, and you know, my one theory was, you know, you just had this, this type of passion. You had, you know, whether it's your career or an outside hobby, you, you had something that gave you a stronger connection with Japan, with the local community. So, you know, you want to see if there's enough people out there, if, if this idea will stick. So I, I contacted just four to six people first, maybe with this idea. And everyone got back to me right away with, oh, I'd, I'd love to be a part of this. You know, I, I think it's a great idea. And I, and so I kind of knew then that, you know, I, I was hopefully onto something. Um, so then I shared it as a, um, open call. So there was a proposal process. Uh, it wasn't, you know, most, most people did go through a proposal process. Um, so I just shared this on multiple Facebook groups about Japan, other sites, um, and then kind of snow, snowball soliciting as well, where, you know, people would know someone they thought would be appropriate. So, uh, just got a wonderful response and, and, farm you know i was worried you know it's one of those things um like i was hoping like maybe maybe if i can get 15 or 20 ideas i might have a book here and and as you can see the book is pretty much double that and uh, and i had to you know i couldn't accept everything um unfortunately so um yeah that's that's kind of how this all came together so um when you look for it there's there's a lot of amazing people out here around japan with a with a great story to tell and i'm just happy to and then they were you know so many of them were so appreciative appreciated to have this opportunity as well to to tell their story that they might not have found another venue for so that was just wonderful it definitely made me smile to come across uh and we've i've talked about this and we've talked to hit upon this a little bit already but uh, Trevor from the Hanshin Tigers English News Podcast, him having something himself in there. Uh, how did you end up uh, getting to know Trevor? Yeah, so um, again, with Trevor, it's one of these things where uh, when you love something like the Hanshin Tigers, you don't think there's anyone out there that knows more than you. And then, uh, and then I stumbled upon uh, Trevor's, Again, he runs the Hanshin Tigers English News uh, Facebook page and podcast. And um, so when I saw, I f first saw that on Facebook, yeah, I was quite fascinated by that and, and kind of refreshed as well because uh, several years ago I did find a, a Tigers blog, but it was just amazingly negative and critical of the team. And it, I was so happy to find it, but then I was just exhausted to look at it where, where Trevor is refreshingly positive, which I guess you kind of have to learn to be as a Tigers fan. So, um, um, so I, I reached out to Trevor previously um, a few years ago because um, are you familiar with, with Pecha Kucha, Pecha Kucha presentations? I'm not, I'm not. Uh, so wonderful concept of, um, you know, look at the site, everyone after pechacucha.com. So it's, it's an international presentation format, uh, 20 by 20. So 20 slides, 20 seconds each, uh, visual hev heavy. And, and we have a wonderful local Pechacucha night, uh, at Nishinomiya here at, um, at Konan University run by, uh, Brent Jones and Roger Palmer, which they've been doing for many years. So I reached out to Trevor from Knowing Hanshin Tigers English News and said, hey, this, this event is always looking for speakers, and I think you're doing great stuff, so it'd be great if you shared your Tigers journey here as well. And, and so he did it, and this was actually during COVID, so he gave this amazing, you can find his presentation uh, on the, that's the great thing with Pecha Kucha is many presentations are recorded, so you have them on the website. So, um, you know, he gave this amazing presentation and, and, but it was on zoom. So we still hadn't actually met. Um, and we finally met recently for a Japan series game cause he happened upon tickets. So ironically, when we met, it was not even at a Hanshin Tigers game, but Oryx Buffaloes, you know, at the Japan series. But we've also, uh, we gave a presentation together, um, 
kind of before the book, but starting to think about this theme of belonging in Japan. So uh, we gave a three or four person presentation uh, a couple years ago as well. So we've we've had this, you know, nice ongoing relationship um, with the Tigers and with other things. I really did enjoy that there was some struggle. There was definite hardship. And like we've said, the overcoming of those uh, different things they had. And one of those in particular was from uh, Karen Hill Anton. And it was a Shoto, uh, Finding My Way in the Way of Writing, uh, really set the tone of the book for me. And reading about her story of studying Japanese calligraphy was really inspiring and makes me want to hear her story, uh, you know, from her own lips. Uh, she seems like such a wonderful person. Uh, what can you tell me about uh, your interactions? Yeah, uh, that you're spot on. Just an am- amazingly wonderful, positive person. And um, uh, that was just such a pleasant surprise where it's one of these things where I did reach out to potential contributors and and Karen just had published in 2020 her wonderful memoir um the view from breast breast pocket mountain and i reached out to her and and you know i expected a response like well who are you i have my memoir read it thanks but no thanks um but but she was wonderfully receptive to the idea and and actually appreciative as well because uh, that's where I, I was already working on collecting ideas for this book. And then I read her memoir and, and, you know, the light switch just went on because she touches on Shoto calligraphy in the book, um, but not so in depthly, but it just showed that this, because she came to Japan more, um, I mean, that her and her husband, William, were world travelers, but Japan was more for his interest because he was coming here to study martial arts. And the beginning years were, were fairly miserable for her because they were staying in this dojo and, and she had no interest in martial arts herself. And they had this very strict sensei. And, and this was the mid 70s in Japan. Uh, but it's when she found Shoto, found calligraphy, that she kind of found her own appreciation for the culture, her own belonging. And, and she studies to this day, she's, she's achieved the need on, uh, you know, second level mastery in calligraphy. And the funny thing with Karen is it's one of these people I felt like I knew for years because when I first came in the nineties, she wrote a column for the Japan times, uh, crossing cultures. So it was just like this motherly figure who was, you know, kind of telling us young foreigners, you know, that we can not only survive, but thrive here, you know, that we're going to have these struggles and, and how to understand these, these cross-cultural complications that we encounter. So it was wonderful just 20 or more years later to, to talk to her recently. And then, and then I finally met her uh, in person because I invited her as a special guest lecturer um, at um, my university, Okayama University, this spring. And then she was also just in Fukuoka last week for the um, uh, JALT, Japan Association of Language Teaching Conference, and um, a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was a Sunday plenary, felt like being in church um, in, in a good way, which just very, just warm, positive, wonderful. Um, you know, she actually got a standing ovation, which I don't think I've ever seen at a, a plenary talk at a language teaching conference. So, um, yeah, just a wonderful, open, giving, uh, fascinating person, as well as her husband, William. And one of the favorite things that I have done in Japan was being able to participate in a taiko drumming session. And uh, when I was looking through the different chapters I could read from, I saw that the Wadaiko Drumming to Your Own Beat by Daniel Lilly. And because of your placement of it, uh, the one that followed as well, uh, Follow the Sound of the Drums, the Passion for Isai, uh, what I was able to remember and relive my past experiences because it was back in 2004 when I did this uh, through Daniel's piece, but then learn co- something completely new about drumming and dancing in Japan from uh, Okinawa, uh, you know, perspective with um, Isa 
like it was really that that placement was a huge uh, part of finding out because I don't know that that would have been one that I would have uh, picked out, you know, but with being that it was right next to I'm like, OK, more drubbing. <laughs> like, I'll yeah. take this. <laughs> um, what are some performances in your time in Japan that have sta- stood out to you? OK, yeah, if I could um, just address your your topic about placement first and I'm I'm very very happy you know overjoyed to hear your words because again that was the kind of putting these similar topic different perspective together where um at first as an editor I'm like oh no I have two two possible chapters about drumming can I really do them both and then I realized that you know you know Daniel's chapter is is wonderful um and he'd only been doing Tycho for like three years, I think. Um, and but it was just such a great chapter of showing how that really got him involved with this local community in a new way. And um, so then again, getting the proposal from Judy Kambara as well. But then it was great because I mean, Tycho has become world famous, but you know how many people have heard of of Asa, the Okinawa drumming and dancing and singing, and and I. To be honest, it was very new to me. Um, and so that was a wonderful chapter as well. So I'm glad by the placement that it got you to read that. And and I, again, to have a story about, it's also a great story about Okinawa because obviously with Okinawa, the foreign presence is not always welcome there with the with the military issues. Um, and, and Judy is, you know, was a military wife. Um, that's how she first ended up in Okinawa. So to see that she was so welcome into that local community by doing, taking part in the local passion was just a yeah, great story. Um, but yeah, going on about more performances. Um, yeah, reading those chapters, I wish I had done, you know, Tycho myself. I never, I, I've tried it, you know, just casually, but I've never joined it as an official activity, you know, long term. But did you ever get to a uh, Kodo experience when you were in Japan, the most famous Tycho group? Um, I, unfortunately, not. But I was part of uh, Japan Fulbright, and we were. Uh, able to be there for a month completely as a guest paid for by Japan. And they, they picked two teachers from each state. So I was part of the one of two from Illinois and we got to travel through high schools, colleges, technical schools, elementary schools. And it was during that time, one of the technical schools we were at um, had a group that they, that was there that performed. And then they took us up, you know, in and, taught us a song and we were able to, uh, you know, play together with that. But I hadn't thought about that in a while, but it's one of those things like being within Japan or wanting to be there long term. There are so many different things you could throw yourself into. Um, like you could, you could lose track of it, but I have not, is that something that you were able to experience yourself? Yeah, so um, that's what I, and they tour internationally, I believe, so that's something I would recommend to an, anyone. Um, so Kodo is, I would assume, the most famous Japanese taiko group, and they live communally on uh, Sato Island in Niigata Prefecture, so I was able to see their performance in Osaka. They also, uh, there's a Earth festival in on Sato Island every August, so uh, that would be another opportunity to see them or other local performances um and that's if people do recommend if do people do visit japan i'd recommend you know trying to see you know some local performances like that um and I, what i what i love is kind of the modernizing of some of the traditional forms um the yoshida brothers the yoshida kyodai are you Yes. Um, yes. So playing the, because um, again, when you when a lot of people think of the shamisen, they might think of this very quiet, traditional plinkety plink type of, but the the uh, sugaru jamisen, I believe it is from the Tohoku region, is a much more you know passionate style of playing, and the Yoshida brothers um, are a great example of that. I've I've seen their uh, wonderful performance as well. So uh, yeah, definitely look out for local music when you come here and i I can't not get on this tangent but just you know talking before about things i appreciate about appreciate about japan is it seems so simple but but people listen to music when they go to the performances you know i i can't appreciate live music back home in the states anymore because people go to talk with their friends and i'm i just don't get this and i i i think 
it's a wonderful thing of Japan is the live music is still very respectful and people listen to the music and, um, you know, you don't hear people talking over the music. So, um, you know, check out some live music when you're in Japan. I know we'd be kind of remiss if we didn't talk about your part and a passion for Japan as well. Um, I know that you were recently on um, Deep in Japan and talked in, you know, more detail uh, about this and listeners um we've had jeff on myself so i know that they're aware of his and we could definitely have you listen to that um in in your uh, experience for you know 50 days and things you had but one of the things that i liked reading about uh was that you have a goal of walking or cycling japan and that is a a a definite goal my friend uh are you still looking to do that or like uh how is that coming along I've, I've always been fascinated with these long distance journeys. Um, so my longest ride and, and there's probably a blog post up somewhere, but in 2011, after the, uh, earthquake and nuclear incident, um, I did cycle over a thousand miles, 1600 kilometers from Kobe here up to Hokkaido and, and through Tohoku. So that was a charity bike ride for, um, which then uh, funds were giving to Second Harvest Japan, um, so to give food packages to people in, in uh, Miyagi uh, Prefecture. So that's something I would still, that was my longest ride, but um, I would, something I would still like to do either on foot or on on two wheels. Because um, yeah, still one of my, uh, rereading it now, as I do every two or three years, is The Roads to Sata by Alan Booth, uh, a British man who you know, walk the length of Japan, um, I believe in the 70s, but the book might have come out in the 70s or 80s when the book came out. So uh, I, I would like to, uh, you know, kind of carry on in his footsteps. It's something I, I still would like to do. No, oh, I, I think it's great. And I, I know that we've really, truly just scratched the surface of a passion for Japan. And there's so much that is there and truly... Do yourself a favor and get this book for yourself, uh, either as a gift for you <laughs> or those that are important in your life. Um, it's going to be something that you're going to want to share. And I've been talking about this and what I've been reading so much to my dad that he's already requested uh, to read the copy after I'm done, but I'm going to have to get him his own because I'm not sure that he's going to give it back after <laughs> reading it. So uh, is there anything else, uh, John, that you want to uh, say about a passion for Japan um, before we kind of move on a little bit further? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just kind of echoing what you said. And, and I do hope people, I think people might get the wrong impression at first that it's just one of these, again, you know, kind of cool Japan, let's glorify the magnificence of Japan. But as we've already touched on it, it's also about the struggle and, and I, and cross-cultural journey. So I, I do think it's, it's much deeper than that. And, and it just makes me very happy to hear that your, your father would read it because that's another great thing I've found with contributors is, you know, I think our life over here as expats is, it's such a mystery, you know, we can, you know, communicate by email or, or Skype these days, but, but what are we really doing over here? So I'm sure a lot of these stories are, are things that, you know, family members have, have not even heard, you know, so I, I do, um, and this isn't just a pitch to sell more books, but I, I truly believe, you know, I hope that, you know, people that, you know, even if you've had family in Japan, you know, and want to kind of get insight into their experiences, um, you know, I, I think um, even if you've never been to Japan yourself, it, I think there's a lot there for all kinds of people. And once you uh, start digging into a passion for Japan, just for me personally, go ahead and reach out to the show and go ahead and share your favorite parts. And I'd love to hear about those and just discuss them uh, with you. John, um, when we're going to kind of move back to a little bit about yourself uh, and what you have, what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing as an educator and editor um, right now? And how are you going about tackling that? As an educator, probably everyone, well, as a university educator, I'm sure many people's fear right now is is the declining, you know, population of Japan and 
and uh, how, you know, will we have enough students, you know, moving forward. So um, I'm quite fortunate. I'm at Okayam University, you know, the um, national university in Okayam Prefecture. So our numbers, you know, haven't, it's, it's more of the small private university. So I fortunately don't see that as much as a problem or challenge for myself. Um, Another thing that's coming up a lot is with the just rapid improvement of translation software software like Google Translate is, you know, will our jobs still be there? And, uh, And I'm not honestly too concerned about that either, because as a university teacher, um, you know, for those that aren't too familiar with the education system in Japan, but you've probably heard that, you know, students take six years of English through secondary school and now even in elementary school. Um, So I'm not, you know, generally teaching like straightforward grammar or vocabulary lessons. It's more, it's, it's time to use and engage with the language. So, you know, even if my students are using, say, Google Translate to, you know, help them prepare their presentation, you know, they've, they've still got to give the presentation. They've still got to get those English words out of their mouth. They've still got to ask questions to their classmates without using Google Translate. So um, this is a concern, but I think um, at least the way with I teach, I, I think it's something that will be, you know, overcome. And, um, and it's not a bad thing that um, it's gotten better. It, it certainly helps with um, when students need to to communicate with the teacher by email, you know, I can now get, uh, you know, if they put their message through Google Translate, you know, so what, you know, now I know exactly what they're trying to say. Uh, it, it's gotten scarily good, um, but that that's a good thing. One thing I like to ask about is if you have any uh, favorite books, podcasts, YouTube shows, just could be about Japan or other topics as well. But uh, what would you like to share with uh, the listeners? Yeah, uh, I think I'll stay Japan specific and um, maybe if, well, it's hard, but if I'd maybe give my top three or four, um, so I, uh, books, because I am, I am, um, although I'm very happy to be on this podcast, I, I don't listen to too many podcasts myself. I'm a reader, uh, although I, I think I'll change, modernize, but um, I previously mentioned um the Roads to Sata by Alan Booth. And I, I think I think this is great to show, again, talking about the over-glorifying of Japan and the politeness of the people, um, you know, walking through Japan when he did. Um, he had some amazing, wonderful experiences, but he also, you know, had some very uncomfortable experiences, uh, discrimination. So it, it's sad that he passed away, you know, so young, so untimely, because I think I've been on similar journeys and I just, I've never had experiences like him where he was, you know, turned away or lied to by a Minshku or Ryokan because they were so uncomfortable with the idea of, of hosting a foreigner. So I, I think it captures a different Japan, which, which has changed, I think, mostly for the good uh, very quickly. Uh, as a baseball fan, I need to mention uh, You Gotta Have Wa, which I'm sure you've read by yes. Robert Whiting. Uh, which is um, you know a history of foreign players in Japan and Japanese baseball. So this is one I recommend again to show that you don't really need to care about baseball. It's it's not it's all about baseball, but it's not really about baseball. It's about again Japan at a certain time and and cross cultural communication. Uh, another favorite book. Yeah, I'd also like to mention one of the contributors to our book, uh, Tim Craig, who wrote one of the sumo chapters. Uh, he has a book called Cool Japan. And although I just said I don't like this Cool Japan movement, uh, this is a very different look where he um, he takes a look at the creative industries of the Cool Japan as a movement. This is a case, too, where I, I, I have little interest in business, and I know very little about business, but Tim is writing from a business background. He has an MBA, so he's taking a deeper look at, say, sumo and J-pop and anime and, and just looking at, you know, how did they just, how did they achieve this, you know, fame on a global scale? You know, what, what did they do to because Japanese culture has just taken off uh, so much. so And it's written as more of a textbook, so it's, it's not 
you know, you don't need much of a business understanding. Um, it's got a gr- lot of great anecdotes as well. Um, so he, he's also writing as a fan himself of, of Japanese culture. So uh, that's another uh, great one. And and I do need to mention one more recent one, um, Pure, uh, Pure Invention by Matt Alt. Uh, is one of the best books you'll find out there about Japan. Again, looking at Japan's, you know, creative industries, but just a great historical look, um, but but very easy to read. Uh, great storyteller, great writer, uh, Matt is. So th- those are just a, a few handfuls of my favorites. Excellent. And once again, where could listeners of Lost Without Japan find and support you? The book itself is exclusive to Amazon, um, so physical copies in select countries, but ebooks everywhere. And you can uh, find me on Facebook. And again, as I mentioned before, um, there is a private um, group just on a passion for Japan. If you'd like to discuss the book, so please find that as well. And again, also on um, Instagram, there is a Passion for Japan uh, page there as well. So those are uh, some of the places to find me. And again, I, I'm I'm like I didn't hesitate to reach out to people like uh, Alice Gordenker or Count Karen Hill Anton in the past. You know, I I I it would really make me happy to hear people's. You know, I get the reviews and stuff, but I, uh, just personal impressions of the book. I'd I'd love to hear them. So yeah, do reach out. Sounds good. And I am going to provide uh, links uh, for uh, Amazon and, um, you know, your Instagram and other things in the show notes as well. So if you're looking for those, uh, feel free to look there to find them. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either of us and we will uh, I'd be happy to point you uh, in any direction that's going to have you be able to read this as well. So I truly thank you, uh, John, for joining us today. Thank you so much uh, just for setting aside some some time for the listeners of Lost Without Japan. And thank you, Michael. It was a wonderful talk. And um, yeah, the last 80 minutes have flown by. We could do another hour on sumo and then an hour on the tigers and an hour on hiking and cycling. But um, I think uh, I think we covered a lot of ground today. So thank you so much again for the invitation and your wonderful uh, kind words about the book. And I, I hope others feel the same. Uh, if, if uh, they read it as well. On behalf of Lost Without Japan and the entire crew, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this interview, and we look forward to seeing you on board again for our next regularly scheduled episode as we continue our discussion of Japan, travel, culture, and your Lost Without moments. Thank you once again, John. To everyone out there, Oginki Day. Stay well, my friends.